everyone, and welcome to Coffee with Kalefi. We'll just switch over from the video to the presentation here, and I'll introduce our host. So today, we are talking about selecting the best water heater. There's no one size fits all for water heaters, and we'll go through some of the, the details for how we get to uh, the right water heater as we go through this. Um, and I think that that, yeah, it looks like the presentation's up. Okay, so if you wanna hit the next slide. Can you hear me? Yep, how's up? Yep. Okay, you want to switch to the second slide? Okay. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going. Do you want me to do the slides? Yeah, is it not advancing on yours? No, I'll I'll run the slides here. Okay, can you see go. that? Yep, I could see it. Okay. All right, so if you are having troubles with the audio, usually the best bet is just to log out and log back in, but there is a tech support number that goes directly to GoToWebinar. Uh, if you want a copy of the presentation, you can just hit yes in the post-webinar survey, um, and then we always archive these on YouTube. So usually a couple of days later, we've got this up on YouTube, which is where we see uh, the majority of our views, I think, over the lifetime of these videos. Uh, we'll send you a certificate of attendance. Uh, this can be uh, self-reported in a lot of states, so you'll get the information that you need to report that in a follow-up email. Okay, in 2021, this is, I guess, the last month of 2021, so we won this year's uh, winner uh, for the angle mix, thermostatic mixing valve, something that we're very uh, excited about and we have good news uh, for 2022 as well so we'll announce that uh, the next webinar of uh, of our series which will be in february we're going to skip january because it's usually right on the uh, front end of ahr so we'll see you in february there okay and speaking of ahr we are going to be at booth n7930 so that's in the north hall we've got a brand new booth this year we're really excited about it you can kind of see a uh, uh, one of the buildings that is our research and development hub over in Italy. We've made kind of a, a version of that at the, the booth, and we're really excited about what we'll be showing there. And uh, I guess here's the graphic. For 2022, we won a finalist for an innovation award again. So I think this is our fifth or sixth award in the last few years for our uh, Legio Mix, uh, Sync Mixer, and Thermosetter uh, DHW Balancing kit in the sustainability category, which is kind of cool. That's a new category for us. Okay, Hydronics 29 is out now. This is on heat exchangers and plumbing systems and hydronic systems. It's a really good issue. A lot of uh, applicable technology there that we talk about uh, in you know mentions all across Hydronics, but this one's focused specifically on that. And then we also will have Hydronics 30 available at AHR. So that's going to come out in next year. And I think that that's going to be uh, I think it's one of my personal favorites, Hydronics 30. So uh, more information to come about that. And uh, another good way to find Hydronics is hydronics.kalefi.com. So if you are, uh, like I used to do, downloading the PDFs and, and searching through them, uh, doing a you know control F to find something in an Hydronics issue, uh, a step up from that is this inter interactive Hydronics that you can go in and sort it by section. So it's kind of made for uh, viewing on a computer instead of just a, a static PDF with some additional resources there. So a really good way to, to find more about Hydronics. Okay, and that takes us to uh, today's presentation. So I'll have uh, Bob toggle on his camera there. <laughs> All right, so I'll turn it over to Bob Hot Rod Roar for uh, how to select the best water heater. Yeah, well, thanks, Max. Thanks for the nice intro, and thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. Happy holidays. Uh, had fun doing this presentation. I hope you enjoy it. What I'm not going to do is tell you what the best water heater is for you. What I'm going to help you do is make a good decision when you choose, So, and there's a lot of choices. There's a lot of overwhelming information out there, but I think I can sift through it and make it uh, uh, pretty understandable for you. And uh, thanks for all the pre-submitted questions. I think I had 35 questions that were pre-submitted. I tried to 
roll a lot of those into the presentation, either in a slide or in my talking points as we go through there. If there's a question that you submitted that I didn't get to, I will um, answer that in an email. I'll get to every question that was submitted. It might take me a couple of days with my hunt and peck method on the keyboard, but um, I'll get there. So um, let's roll with the slides, Max. Yeah, okay, so here's some of the things that we're going to talk about. I won't read through all the talking points there. I got some pictures. Uh, we are a member of one of the Adobe sites, so some of those I pulled off there. So you can see there's a lot of different choices in the styles, the look, um, the type of water heaters that we have in there. Uh, we're going to talk about how to compare the different ones, you know, return on investment. That's important to some people. So um, we'll talk a little bit about how you can size them properly. I got uh, some information on the new... Um, water demand calculator that IAPMO has been working on. So let's roll through that. So the very first step should always be um, defining what the load is. You know, how much hot water does the building, does the homeowner, does the application require? Now, if you're going to a, a you know, home of an old folk like me, where they've had a 40 gallon electric water heater for their entire life, you're probably safe at replacing that with a similar size water heater. But what you will find as you go to the homes and go to a business and stuff, the um, the demand can change. You know, maybe the building's been upgraded or something like that. Maybe they have less demand than they did in the past. Maybe they've added on to the house or they've had more kids or something like that and they need or they want more hot water. So you should really try and get a handle on that number, even on a big residential job, certainly on a commercial job in a hotel or something like that. You don't want to miss miss the number. So I'll take you through some steps that can maybe simplify that. It's not as complicated or hard as it seems to come up with a good number on what your what your load is. So Next slide, thanks. So back in the day, there was a fellow by the name of Roy B. Hunter, and he came up with this formula. This goes back to the 1940s. He came up with this formula here uh, to, to uh, come up with a water calculation. And uh, I think uh, my friend Julius Blanco, the engineer, writes for some of the magazines. That's his verbiage over there on the left. Pretty, pretty, pretty pretty well. He summed it up. And uh, if you look at that last paragraph over there, Hunter's approach to uh, solve this engineering problem was statistical. Um, and if you read down further there, he used the binomial distribution. Now, here's where it got me to estimate the probability of an arbitrary instant of observation. So pretty vague to me. And there's the math that he came up with to do that. Now, keep in mind, this was done back in the 1930s and 40s when we didn't have computers. We didn't have calculators. In fact, what did you use? An, an abacus or maybe a slide rule that was carved out of a whale? bone or something like that. So uh, pretty impressive work that he did there back in those days to come up with this chart that we've been using up until recently. And some people maybe still use this Hunter curve to come up with it. And uh, don't quote me on this, but I think Roy B. Hunter actually went to different schools with Johnny B. Good. Um, now, there's one thing and I'm going to give a gift to the person that can type in an answer. Give me one reason why Johnny B. Good probably wouldn't have come up with this calculation and the, the right answer will send you a little gift. So, um, yeah, interesting uh, when you dig into how we have come up with uh, load calculations for hot water, domestic water in general. So I'll show you a better way of doing it, a newer way of doing it, perhaps. Okay. So this is new. Um, I have them put together and they've been working on this for a while and they are upgrading as we go along. They're trying to get it, you know, fine tuned. So basically it's an Excel spreadsheet and the white boxes there, you can just put in the information of your, your building, your home, whatever you're trying to do the load calculation on. So and what I did on this calculation here, I was at a project in uh, Long Island here uh, maybe a month ago, and they had a thermostatic mixing valve that was giving them problems. So I took this along, and it was a 16-unit. It's a retirement community, you know, older people and couples, so not a huge demand for water but like you might see if, uh, you know, a family or younger people. So what you can do with this calculator, as you can see in the boxes there, is I could come up with the uh, fixture load count and then how much water that building would need. Now, what you can also do with this, if you notice, I didn't check any toilets on this. So now what this will give me is a pretty accurate hot water demand load. So for this building right here, what we come up with about 16, 16 gallons per minute, this thing had a massive mixing valve, and I think it was at least a two inch, as I recall, a mixing valve in there for this small load of, and again, this is a design condition of 16 gallons a minute for this building. So the valve was grossly oversized, and as a result, it was inaccurate. It was hunting all over the place. So this is a really quick and simple way to do it. I mean, you can download this for free. 
at the RFMO site. If you just Google on um, water demand calculator, it'll come up also. So it's easy to find this, it's easy to use this and uh, play around with it. You can you know, change the inputs on these boxes over on the white boxes. If you do have an older uh, shower head or something that maybe is two gallons a minute or three gallons a minute or a rainfall that's five gallons a minute, you can change that in that box also so it doesn't use the default. So you should be able to get a very accurate number with this new calculator and you can see at the top you can select the type of building if it's a residence or a multi-family so this is pretty accurate the one thing it struggles with a little bit and they're still working on is like if you check the uh, hotel hotels can vary quite a bit on the water demand you could have a you know a hotel along the interstate like a holiday inn express where it's just rooms or you could have a hotel that has the banquet facility and meeting rooms and two restaurants and dishwashers and a laundry so that's going to be a pretty different load than you would have on just a you know hotel that's just a quick drive with just room so you got to be careful with some of the uh, some of the inputs you make so that'll give you your number now let's go to talk about some other products now another thing you can do and my friend Pete Skinner who did a webinar for us not uh, recently um, he's got this data logger package and he goes around to buildings and he'll put a data logger on the building he can either see the entire load by putting it on the main water line or if you just put it on the feed to the water heater he can put that logger on there and leave it for maybe a month or two and get pretty accurate information on what's exactly going on in that building instead of just using a calculator that assumes a certain load profile this is a way to get a, a pretty exacting number now um <clears throat> It takes some time to do that. You got to crunch all that data, put it into a log and stuff like that. But um, you can rent these. If you go online, there's a lot of places that will rent data loggers by the day, the week, the month, the year, whatever. So you don't have to invest a lot of money if you really want to get that information, get it accurately, or if you're doing you know, a lot of bids or something like that, and you want to make sure that your bid is right and accurate. Uh, you might want to look into trying out or rent one of these meters for your next uh, your next job or application. Okay. Now, one of the biggest things that you're going to find as you start looking uh, at sizing water heaters is the temperature of the water coming in. I was down in Arizona again a couple months ago, and the water down there, I think, is about 80 degrees in the street. And in the summertime, if you happen to have PEX tubing going through your attic, your cold water can get up over 100 degrees. So that's a short lift. That's a pretty easy load to cover. Uh, I asked Cody what the water temperature is up there in Milwaukee, the city water, where it's stored above ground. You know, it's going to get down into the 30s midwinter up there in uh, some of those colder northern states so if you're going from say i don't know 37 degrees up to 120 degrees that's a much bigger lift so that little map over there on the left kind of gives you that information um, i'm going to wait a little bit on the, uh, the graph on the right and talk to that a little bit more as we go down to uh, sizing mixing belt and stuff but we have that graph available that can give you the um how much you can extend the water heater by elevating the temperature and mixing it down and see so you put together that formula but i'm going to hold off on that let's talk a little bit more about the different products and then we'll go into uh thermostatic mixing valves where we can use that formula a little better okay yeah i mean you know there were options out there for domestic hot water that i hadn't even heard of as i started doing the research on this now i have uh, experience with most of these on here i don't have a lot of at the bottom there is a tankless coil that bolts right in the side of the boiler. It just uses the boiler water around that copper coil to instantly make hot water as it goes through there. I've seen them. I know what they are. I know how they work. I know the problems with them. I know the ins and outs. The biggest issue if you use a tankless coil like that is you really need to have a mixing valve on that, an accurate listed mixing valve, because that temperature of that coil can get up to whatever that boiler is running. So you certainly don't want to be sending, you know, 180 degree plus water out to the faucet. So critical on that we've got a great valve for that that we'll talk about later that's a really quick responding valve that works great on those tankless um those tankless coils that go in boilers so over there on the left tankless water heaters tankless coils indirects combi boilers one of my favorites uh solar external heat exchangers and also heat pump water heaters which i don't know if i can turn my screen i've got one of those right to the side here and i've had some hands-on experience with that over the past week so i can talk to that with a little bit more knowledge than i did uh a couple of weeks ago before I had tried one. So, all right, going on. All right, so probably the most common is the tank type of water heater. That's the one that happens to be in my basement. This is a house that we just bought here back in May. So 
I didn't install that. A couple things you'll notice looking at that, it's got a seismic strap around it. Those are required here in Utah. Gas flex, which sometimes looks a little sloppy, but again, that's for seismic reasons. If the tank does happen to shake someday, uh, you don't snap off a gas line. Sometimes they use flexes on the water supplies for the same reason. Uh, thermal expansion tank, which yes, could use a better support on it. I'll get to that one of these days. But, you know, 38,000 BTUs, that's a typical 50 gallon uh, gas fired water heater. Um, they come in gas, you can get them in oil, you can get them in electric, you can get them in LP. And now we've got uh, heat pump water heaters like I just showed you off here in my shop that we'll talk about too. But still, the biggest part of the market is going to be a tank type. Now, if you go to Europe, very few tank type water heaters over there. You'll see some indirect water heaters that would work off a of boiler or district system. But for the most part, they, um, they're a tankless or a combi uh, boiler type of market for domestic hot water. <clears throat> okay. Indirect tanks, this is very popular with um, people that have a boiler. If you have a boiler in your house for um, your heating loads, this is a pretty uh, pretty easy, good application. They come in a lot of different sizes, a lot of different types. You can get stainless, you can get uh, glass line steel versions of it. You can get them with multiple coils. Uh, you can get them with backup now, um, you know, electric element backup if you want to have a dual source. Um, there's some exotic ones I've seen over the years. They made them out of copper at one point. There was some red brass. There was some made out of exotic metals like Manel and, uh, you know, titanium stabilized stainless steels. But it's a pretty good application in that it's a well-insulated tank. So very little standby losses. There's no flue pipe going through the center of it like on the tank heater, uh, heater that we showed previously. A little bit of loss on that because that, um, you know, you got a draft going through there all the time. So some of your heat's going up the flue with this. You can see it's well insulated, and there's a couple examples. Another one in my basement that I haven't gotten around to hooking up there, that's a, a dual coil tank there on the left, and that's a, what we call reverse indirect on the right. Thermal 2000 makes these where the tank, uh, we'll talk about this, I guess, maybe better on the next slide, but the tank holds the boiler water, then the domestic water goes through the copper coil, and it heats it as it flows through there. So that's a great application, too. A lot of copper, a lot of uh, good heat exchange in those tanks. Okay, solar tanks, really it's an indirect tank. Typically a solar tank will have an electric element in it somewhere, usually at the midpoint in the tank. So if you don't have enough solar, the electric element would kick on. You can get them in dual coils. So if you wanted to feed one coil with the solar, the other coil with the boiler, some other heat source, you could do that. On the far right there, you can see, uh, this is an application I've actually tried a couple times in my own home, in my shop. Uh, it's a tank with a coil inside of it, similar to the reverse and direct, but I'm also using that as a solar drain back tank. So you can see that air bubble at the top. Um, it's both my expansion tank on my solar, but it's also the air bubble that breaks the siphon when the pump shuts off on the solar, so it drains back. So now I've got a tank that's actually serving three functions. It's making my domestic water, it's my solar storage tank, and it's also my drain back tank. Critical on a solar tank is you got to have a mixing valve on these. These tanks can get up to, uh, in fact, we've seen them in some instances where they'll pop that 210 degree uh, relief valve on the top because that tank will get that hot, stratify and pop that valve. So you certainly don't want to be sending 200 degree water into somebody's faucet. So you definitely want to have a good mixing valve on any solar tank because they can certainly... Uh, they can get hot even in the winter time if you've got an evacuated tube system i've seen those reach 160 degrees even on a cold winter day um, so you've got to protect it all the time okay ah yes the heat pump water heater this is getting a lot of attention right now for a number of reasons one of them being the electrification movement that's going on uh, in a lot of places california certainly uh, is probably the leader in that um, that goal to electrify the state. So what are you left with? You're left with electric water heater, which, you know, with their Title 24 out there, electric water heater might not meet that uh, requirement for efficiency. So it really comes down to a, a heat pump type of application. So here, this is a pretty good drawing of what they look like once you strip everything off them. Uh, basically just a coil of copper around the outside of the tank. It's not an internal coil, so you don't have to worry about if it leaks someday or if you have a problem with that coil in your water. So it's just some refrigeration grade copper tubing wrapped around the bottom of that and just a regular, um, almost looks like a little water cooler um, type of compressor on the top of it when you look at the physical size of it. Most of these will have electric elements in it. We'll get to why that's important in a minute. So if the heat pump uh, can't keep up or isn't working or isn't catching the load quick enough, you can start kicking on one or two elements. The one I've got here in A.O. Smith 80 actually has uh, 
two elements, so you can use it in three modes. You can use it in efficiency mode, which is just the heat pump, and I learned an important lesson with that. And then you can put it in the mode where the electric resistance will kick on uh, to help the heat pump, or you can put it in the vacation mode where the electric elements will maintain, I think, a 45 degree temperature to keep it from uh, keep it from freezing. So you'll see pretty much all the major brands now have a heat pump water heater offering out there. There's some that you can buy just the top part, put it on your own tank, and uh, you know build your own heat pump type of water heater. But let's look a little bit more at what I learned about this type of heater because I think you're going to be seeing more and more of these, and I want to make sure you understand some of the limitations on this type of water heater. Hey, Bob, I just wanted to jump in here, too, and just tell you that you're not alone. Uh, there are a couple of Chuck Berry fans out there that did respond wow. to your Johnny Be Good question. So uh, <laughs> congratulations, I believe, go out to Paula. So we'll have to get a, a little gift out to Paula as well. All right. Well, thanks for playing our game. <laughs> All right. So back in my shop, I kind of I'm there in real time as well as a picture. So what I did is I got this uh, this water heater this heat pump water heater is an 80 gallon ao smith became mine after it was freight damaged and one of the thanks to wind supplier in salt lake for offering this to me you can see it kind of fell on its face there you can see on the top where it's kind of caved in got it home took it apart uh, it worked plugged it in it takes about 20 minutes when you first plug these in they go through a self-diagnostic which i thought it was broken but after 20 minutes of dashes flashing across the screen it came on and fired up First thing I notice is the noise. Uh, so down at the bottom there, I've got a little meter on my iPhone that I can check it. So on the left there, as you can see the range, I think it went up as high as uh, 73 decibels. Uh, that's then about a couple feet away from the heat pump water heater. On the right, that's my ModCon boiler that you can see behind me, a little wall hung uh, lock and bar night boiler. So quite a bit noisier than the, um, than the boiler when it's running. Uh, the other thing, the big eye opener, because so in my Neanderthal engineering way of thinking, I thought, well, I'll just set this in my shop, which is 900 square feet, well insulated, foam everywhere on it, well insulated door and everything. I'll just set this in there and it'll give me 120 degree water and I'll heat my radiant floor with this. It'll be great. It'll be, you know, high COP. What could go wrong? Well, a couple things did go wrong is number one, it blows cold air out. So you can see that little gauge up on the upper right-hand corner there. When this thing is running, it was varying somewhere between 45 and 48 degrees air temperature coming off. I don't know how many CFM comes off that fan, but it's considerable enough that there was cold draft in the shop as this thing was running. So to get to that 120 degree water, I was blowing 48 degree air into my shop. So, you know, it's kind of, I think somebody explained to me as I was trying to come up with a, maybe a reverse perpetual motion here. I thought I could get, you know, pull air temperature and heat my shop, but it, it's not gonna happen. The heat has to come from somewhere is the bottom line. It's called a heat pump because it moves heat. It doesn't generate heat other than the elements kicking on. It just moves it from my air temperature and the space that we're in into the water. And you can't, you can't cheat mother nature, the laws of thermodynamics. There just wasn't gonna be enough heat in the air to pull out without allowing outside air in, which was 20 degrees and it needs 45 degrees. So anyways, to make a long story long, it didn't work for a uh, for radiant heat source. Now, what I will tell you, if you're looking at these, obviously you're gonna need some space. And I would say these aren't gonna work. And one of the questions submitted is, can I put one of these in my condo? Well, I would question where it would be put and how much heat you can pull out of that condo to exchange into the heat pump. If it's a small condo and you're trying to put this in a closet or something like that, it's probably not going to be able to work in the heat, po heat pump only mode uh, very successfully without um, cooling down your space or also uh, taking a long time to heat up. And so the third thing that I discovered on this, it takes a long time. So I plugged this thing in, I think about noon and uh, went to bed at nine o'clock and it still wasn't up to 120 degrees. So searching around, I found information that says 80 gallons from a 55 lift to 120, it's gonna take about 12 hours. So I don't know how many families could work within that uh, restraint, constraint. Um, now, certainly I could kick on the electric elements and it would you know, be like an electric water heater, two 4,500 watt elements, top and bottom could you know, move back and forth and heat that up a lot quicker, but then I don't have my high COP anymore. So you can have it both ways. If you want to run on just heat pump only, it's going to be noisy and it's going to take time and it's going to blow 12 hours worth of cold air into your space. So. That's what I learned with my um, my heat pump experiment. So, 
I would say properly applied where you need some cooling. In fact, what I would do with this next is I'd probably put it in the garage of my shop and my home and use it in the uh, summertime when my shop is 100 degrees out there. I want to cool that off. I got a good exchange there and then, uh, you know, just take it offline and drain it in the wintertime and go back to my uh, gas fired water heater maybe. So I don't know. I'll think about it. So. Yeah, Bob, you mentioned too about where you, where you put this and everything like that. And and uh, I know in the New England area, they get some pretty heavy duty rebates for putting in heat pump water heaters. And so everybody's kind of jumping on that bandwagon, but you've also got houses there that are 100 plus years old and have the draftiest basements in the world. And now all of a sudden they're 45 or 50 degrees in the winter time, you know, I'm barely hanging on. And it's, it's a little tougher for those heat pumps uh, to work at that kind of uh, ambient temperatures. Yeah. And that being said, Cody, I think the market for these obviously would be, you know, Southern California California, any, you know, sure. the southern sunbelt states where it's warm. I mean, you got the air temperature there to make it work and you got the need for cooling a lot of the time. So that's probably a good market. I would just caution you when you take it, like Cody said, in those colder climates, you might not get the results you expect. So somebody presented this question to John Siegenthaler, did the math on this as he always does. So, well, what about if I had a high efficiency air to water heat pump heating my house, heating my space, my building, whatever it might be. And then I put a heat pump water heater in there because now I'm getting the COP of the air to water heat pump to heat my space. And I'm using that space temperature now to exchange through the heat pump water heater. Well, if you look at the numbers there, I hope you can see that they're pretty small on my screen and crunch through the numbers. Yeah, that's not the best way to do it. You'd be better off getting an air to water heat pump that can also provide the domestic hot water um, through that because you're going to, you can never exchange and keep even. There's always going to be some efficiency loss. And you can see what you come up with there a two COP under this condition here, where running on its own, you might have a, up to four COP. Again, it's going to depend on the, the ambient air temperature around it to crank that number. I would caution you on the manufacturer's information. Sometimes I don't know where they test these things, but sometimes their information isn't real world application. So make sure that you know how to figure that out, your temperature lift, what kind of air temperature it's gonna be uh, in so it can work efficiently, so. We had another comment too, that some models um, can be ducted to a different room or outside too. So maybe you put it in your house, but it's ducted to the garage or ducted outside. Uh, again, like you're saying, is going to be regionally dependent, but that might give you some more flexibility. Yeah. And then I thought of that in my shop. I said, well, I'll just open a little opening in the shop, but it was 22 degrees outside. I can't bring 22 degree air into it when it needs 45 degree air. Number one, I'm cooling my space with that air I'm bringing in. So, it, you know, it starts to look like a dog chasing its tail at some point here. Glad I tried it so I could speak to that a little bit more because I had seen rumor or heard rumors of how they do work great or they don't work at all. So there's the reasons why you would uh, come up with that, that answer for your exact application. Now, sometimes multiple tanks is another way. If you have one source and you want to have a big dump load, like a hotel, for example, where you've got during the day when nobody's in the rooms, they come back at night, you want a big dump load, you might have one source and put multiple tanks. So what I'm showing here in these two drawings, a couple ways that you can pipe those. Uh, you can do a reverse return, like we show at the top, a lot of piping, a lot of insulation, a lot of labor, put that together. Know that our quick setter in the low lead version, the quick setter plus, uh, can be used to balance those tanks. So if you look at the bottom there, we put quick setters on both the um, hot water coming from the boiler to feed in direct tanks, but also on the domestic water draw from that. And then we can balance those tanks against one another. So you pull evenly from the tanks and uh, maximize that drawdown on multiple tanks like that. So uh, yeah, that's it. Oh, we're looking for time here. No, pretty good. All right, tankless. I think one of the magazines recently did a survey on tankless water heater, and they they uh, talked to a bunch of manufacturers and people that use them. And I thought the number I remember is like 40% of uh, water heater sales now are tankless water heaters. So a lot of these going in in uh, replacement of uh, tank type water heaters. Um, thanks to Mike for letting me use that picture on the right there. He calls himself the Renai guy. That's his specialty in certain climates. They can go on outside the building like you see there. Uh, Southern California, certainly you see a lot of them. In fact, Cody and I were down in the Carolinas here last week and uh, we saw water heaters on the outside of buildings down there, both the uh, tank type as well as the tankless type of heater. So all sorts of sizes, all sorts of brands. There's gotta be 50 different manufacturers of tankless water heaters that I can count. Uh, that are out there. So you have a lot of different sizes, you have a lot of different uh, 
uh, fuel sources, LP, electric, uh, natural gas. Um, I was reminded, and I didn't get to it, sorry, Tommy uh, sent me a thing. He said, you know, there's also a gas-fired uh, heat pumps out there. I didn't get to that natural gas-fired uh, heat pump type of water heaters that are available too, similar like you would have in an RV where you use propane to uh, to heat the water or heat the um, um, to the refrigeration cycle. One thing on these tankless, again, you got to look at that temperature lift. Uh, and I've seen different information out there. Some of them will look at a 70 degree temperature lift. So if you take your incoming water temperature, add 70, that's what the, the rating is at. Some of them use a 77 degree lift, which obviously in those cold climates, that's going to be a more realistic number. So when you look at the output in gallons per minute, make sure that you know, you know what temperature, uh, the delta T or the temperature lift that you're asking that, uh, that unit to do. And um, like we saw in that first picture, you can see a, a lot of different brands. They look nice, you know, you see them inside of uh, kitchens, a lot of places when you go in Europe, right next to the refrigerator, there you see a, a tankless or a combi boiler uh, hanging on the wall. So they make them pretty, uh, pretty sleek looking. You can get little point of use electric ones too that you could put under a sink, for example, if you wanted to boost, or if you wanted, you know, if you just had a hand wash sink or something like that, maybe a little electric tankless heater would be uh, another option for you. So then I saw this at, um, uh, oh, let's do a poll question first. All right, so for the people, how many, we got oh, hundreds of people tuned in today. How many people are installing, if you're an installer, if you're spec and equipment uh, tankless? Let's see what we come up with here. See if it comes close to that 40% that the manufacturers talk about. I guess I'd be curious too, Bob, you know, you talk about tank versus tankless. I mean, obviously tank type water heaters have been running into some pricing issues here recently. I, I wonder how that's affecting tankless sales, just not only because of availability, but because of cost. Too. Well, yeah, good point in this day and age with metal shortage and everything else going on. See, now that surprised me. I would have thought it would have been higher than that. So, well, it's good information to know, and maybe it's the, the group that we have attending today is... Um, could skew that number if we had all contractors. We get heavy on engineers, it looks like again today. So um, yeah, they're not going away. And uh, the other thing uh, we visited with a, a large mechanical contractor when we we're down in the Carolinas, Cody and I last week, and they basically have two options when they go to a, a customer that needs a new water heater. They have what they call a super tank, where they put a tank in with our tank mixers. Thank you for selling 20 of those a week or whatever. They put a tank mixer on it and they raise the temperature of the tank and put a tank mixer so they can give them a lot of hot water from a small tank. So they'll put a 40 or 50 gallon in. I'll show you the numbers on that, how you can calculate uh, if you run an elevated temperature, how much that changes the drawdown of that tank. And their other option is a tankless. Now tankless uh, can get pretty expensive if they have to, uh, you know, run a gas line, a bigger gas line, or, you know, find a location where they can vent it differently with the, uh, if it's condensing type with PVC or something. So, you know that's their two their two options is their their super super water heater they call it or a tankless and that's um it works for his market so um yeah thanks for for the poll information then i saw this at a trade show a couple of years ago i'm thinking well have we come full circle here with this so this is a product that uh, renai makes so it's a tankless water heater that's on a tank so i guess that gives you a little a little bit more um uh, storage, a little bit more buffer for a big drawdown, and also, you know, the efficiency of a, a tank, uh, tank this type of water here that must be a condensing one since it looks like it's vented with PVC. So I don't know if these are uh, popular out there or not, but um, I'll talk to our Renai people that I know and try and get some more information on the application for this uh, tank and tankless that are kind of married together into one product. Okay. Yeah, so I took this picture. I got a chance to uh, tour the pepper mill out in Reno, color, uh, Reno, uh, Nevada. Sorry, um, they have this big plate heat exchanger that makes domestic water for that entire property. There's thousands of rooms, and there's pools, and there's all sorts of things going on there. So, a huge domestic hot water load, and they have. I think they've got eight or 10 uh, geo wells, hot water wells out there. Their latest one, I think is 600 and some gallons a minute of 178 degree water. So that's what they run through that big plate heat exchanger. And that's how they generate domestic hot water. And then they just had rows and rows of uh, insulated storage tanks. So this thing all day long is just going through that heat exchanger, generating hot water for that uh, 
10,000 rooms. I don't know how many rooms are in that building. It's huge. Every time I go out there, it seems like there's a, another uh, couple thousand rooms that have been added on to that. But this is a pretty simple technology that could really be used with any heat source. I know the wood boiler people uh, commonly you will use a uh, heat exchanger of some sort, and it can be as simple as that drawing I've showed over there on the right. So all I need is a pump to circulate the water from whatever, the boiler, the geo well, uh, the wood boiler, whatever it might be, through one side, call it the A side of the heat exchanger. On the other side, I put a flow switch, so whenever I op open a hot water faucet or a draw demand or something, uh, the switch just basically turns on that pump, pumps the water through the one side. So this is kind of an instantaneous um, home build type of a uh, uh, application with a plate heat exchanger. Uh, obviously, it has to be sized properly. You know, you're going to find that size of that can get pretty big if you need a lot of, if you start talking five, six, seven gallon per minute loads. But uh, there's heat exchangers, as you can see in the pictures that come from, I mean, these small ones in the combi boilers, I think are three by eights, maybe 10 plates. And that one over there, I don't even know how many plates that are, but uh, it's certainly bigger than three by eight inches, isn't it? And by the, you know, 12 inch piping going to it. So, yeah, and that gets used commonly with waste heat. You know, if you've got steam or waste heat from some kind of uh, production facility, um, you know, put it through a heat exchanger and you can grab your, your domestic water that way. Again, I would use a mixing valve on that. You know, if that uh, A side temperature comes from steam, for example, or from some high temperature application, obviously that B side is gonna get within a few degrees of that at some point. So uh, make sure that you protect the, um, the occupants. And this one right here we show if, it was on say a solar application and you didn't have enough solar obviously at night you could pair it with a little tankless heater there that would be your booster it would take over when your when your source drops too low okay yeah and so to to answer that um that need or demand there's two companies i found uh probably everybody knows a utica boiler they make a module now that you can do that it's got everything built right inside of it and you can see the little graph sorry that the print gets so small when I try and get too much on one slide here. But if you show your boiler input that you can give to that module there, it'll show you what your output is. And I like that they show it at different temperature lifts. I talked about 70 and 70 degree uh, temperature lifts. It'll show you what um, what you could get out. Of, yeah, thanks. Get out of that module there. So that's a good way if you've got a boiler and you want to just uh, you know put one of these in without having to add a tank or if you don't have room for a tank or whatever, uh, you can size one of these to... Um, to make your domestic hot water. And uh, HeatLink has a couple different versions. HeatLink does a couple different things with their modules. You can take like a, a tank type water heater and put a module on to take a little bit radiant off it. Or if you have a boiler or something else, um, you could put into this module to get your domestic hot water. So you could use it, you know, either direction, but that's another good option. I like that they build them with all the, um, you know, the controls and the check valves and everything's in there in the right place. So it's just pretty much, as you can see, plug and play. It's even got a plug hanging out of it. Doesn't get any easier than that. All right, those have been around for a while. I remember uh, Robert Bean, when he worked for Dan Foss, invented that ZCP zone control panel, and they had some of those modules that they made with little flat plate heat exchangers and the pump and everything in a nice, nicely packaged uh, box. Okay, we're we looking here, doing pretty good. All right, so getting back to that that concept of taking a, a small water heater and raising the temperature in that water heater and uh, supplying, you know, more water. So what we would do, you can see this little graph is actually on our, uh, in with our products are on that tank mixer on the cell sheet. What you do there is you go in and you see the storage tank temperature. So in this example here, let's say we've got 160 degree, we're going to crank that tank up to 160 degrees. And that uh, that color bar, if you go to the maps out there, I think that would be somewhere probably the southern states, maybe somewhere in Georgia or something like that with 62 incoming temperature at the top there. So if you take that to 160 degrees with 62 degree incoming temperature, we're going to get a 69% uh, increase in the capacity of that tank. So if you had a 50 gallon tank times a uh, 69 percent you can see that takes it up to what uh, 80 what's the example code 84 gallons or something like that I think uh, or you can use the math so Siggy put this formula together for me he said yeah it's just the basic uh, you know BTU formula right there if you know the temperature coming in the temperature that you want to lift it um, 80 gallons there times the lift gives you 110 gallons so uh, you can use the graph or you can use uh, the math to come up with that calculation 
I will caution you as you raise, and in fact, I got a slide towards the end on this, as you raise the temperature of the tank, you're gonna get a lot more mineral precipitation out and you probably will shorten the length of that tank when you start running those elevated temperatures. So there's trade-offs to everything we do. The other on the plus side, the other thing about elevate the tank temperature above 140, now you've got uh, anti-legionella protection by making sure that tank is uh, running hot enough to kill off any bacteria that might get into it. So that alone might be a reason that somebody would want an elevated temperature and uh, and mix it down. And we've got a great um, tank mixer, we call it. You can see there on the left, it's a kit that comes with a great quick responding mixing valve. It's an angle pattern, so you just go straight through. Um, it's got a port for the re recirculation pump you want to use. It. It's got a long flex tubing, so if you've got a power vent or something you have to go around, um, and I think we've got a pretty nice package there if, uh, if you need something like that. Hey, Bob, I had a quick question, too, about this. You know, obviously putting a, a mixing valve like this, a small mixing valve on an electric water heater or a gas water heater like you'd find in a residential application, I mean, that, that could definitely expand the capacity or get you a little more bang for your buck out of that tank. But what do you think about putting something like that on a heat pump water heater? Obviously, you know, you're talking about raising the tank temperature. Can the heat pump even get it that hot on its own, or would it have to use the electric elements and kind of defeat the purpose of, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think I'm, I'm speaking for the one I've got here in the manual that I downloaded, it said 120 degrees is a comfortable range for the heat pump only mode. I think you're right. If you did want to kick on the element, certainly sky's the limit that you can get up to 140 or hotter. I think there's something about a high temperature on mine too, that it locks out if you try and run it too hot. I don't know if that affects the heat pump if it tried to kick on or something, but yeah, I would say the comfortable number would be 120 degrees for a heat pump only water heater. Uh, maybe they make a, you know, newer versions of them that can be efficient at higher temperatures. Certainly, you can go higher, but you start to lose your COP as you're as you're trying to you know drive that to a higher operating condition. So that's a that's a good point. But um, yeah, I mean, I'll I'll learn more about these heat pump water heaters because I know they're they're certainly uh, in vogue these days, so to speak. Well, and another fun one, kind of along the same lines, is you know uh, there there are places where again they're offering these big rebates for the water heaters, heat pump water heaters, but then they're also the same places where they require mixing valves on everything, like Vermont, for example. And uh, you know it's it's always funny you have these conversations. You think that mixing valves don't produce hot water; they just they use what they get, you know, kind of thing. And, and uh, you know, you get the questions, well, my mixing valve's not working. Well, is your is your tank up to temperature yet even? You know, you mentioned before that it could take 12 hours to bring that tank up to temp and it just takes a long time. So keep something to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And uh, I, we know there are states, uh, what, three or four states that require a mixing valve on any domestic hot water uh, source, whatever it might be, a tank or tankless or a tankless coil in the boiler or something like that. But now there was another thing, you brought up another thing that uh, I thought of on the tankless water heater manufacturers went and got a new standard built um, that they claim that their tankless water heaters can, uh, or combis too, can maintain the outlet temperature as accurate as a mixing valve, and they shouldn't have to be required to have a mixing valve. Now, that what a 1063 is that new standard? I forget, there's three different numbers. I think a 61, 63 standard, but I don't see anybody uh, promoting or advertising that. I know they petition to get that uh, that new standard developed, but I don't see it being advertised. So, you know, if in fact they can convince the, um, inspectors, I guess, whoever's looking at the job, that their tankless can maintain that outlet temperature plus or minus two degrees or whatever the standard that, they, uh, that they're that they trying to meet, then really you shouldn't need a thermostatic mixing valve on it. My experience with tankless heaters, the limited experience I have, is they can overshoot. You know, you can have issues with that gas valve where they can uh, overshoot their target temperature, the temperature that you intend to get. So I think I would still want to have... Um, you know, just reliability issues have some kind of protection on that, even if it um, claimed it could maintain an outlet temperature. You know, things go wrong, things can go bad. So thermostatic mixing valves um, are pretty good final protection. We'll talk about those a little bit more as we go on, you know, how accurate they can be and how they can, uh, you know, point of use can be what you need. Um, yeah, I think that's good on that. And certainly we can help you with that. If you are going to run elevated temperatures or you have an application where you need a mixing valve, we've got a lot of different sizes, a lot of different uh, styles of them uh, from a small under sink mixer that you see there on the left to our big uh, motorized ball valve type of legio mix, which is both a mixing valve and also a legionella um, protection device. So give us a call if you need uh, 
an application that uh, we can help you with. Okay. Yeah, and just the way I'm bad is I like to try things. So I, uh, my last shop when we were still in Missouri, I, I took one of every mixing valve that we had to offer from Cluffy and made a little demo of it and just actually put hot water to all those valves and just played around with different mix temperatures. What I was really trying to find out is how well these valves will shut off if you lose, say, your cold water supply to a valve. You want that valve to fail so you don't um, scald somebody by having all hot water. And I'm uh, pleased to report that every one of those valves did exactly as we advertised as far as the um, shutting the failing cold and also do it in, in the response time that uh, would protect the, um, the end user if they had one of those valves in them. All right. Yeah, so when we talk about thermostatic mixing valves, there's two different mixing valves that you'll hear about. One is called the point of distribution. That will go right at the uh, tank or the tankless water heater, whatever your source of hot water is. That'll have an ASSC standard 1017, 1017. In addition to that, there's another valve that's called the point of use valve, and this will have a different standard. This is an ASSC 1070, and this is a valve that's intended to go right at the final use, as you can see in the picture here. So this will go under the sink, maybe goes at the end of a row of sinks, uh, like in a public restroom, you might see one mixing valve that does a whole row of sinks. It's limited to 120 degrees. It can't be set higher than that. It has a tamper-proof knob on it, so somebody can't just reach under there and just start turning and changing the temperature, even though it won't go above 120. 20, 120 is still pretty warm if uh, if you weren't used to that. So it's a very accurate valve. It's a fast responding valve. It's the valve that you want to use at your final um, fixture, faucet, sink, shower. A lot of shower valves will have some kind of mixing uh, valve built into them, either pressure and temperature. Some of them will have pressure and temperature balancing built into it. That I think is a 1061 valve, a different listing on that. So um okay i think i covered that all right another poll question trying to get some intel on uh, how many valves we know by the number that we've been selling that uh, somebody's certainly embracing the thermostatic mixing valve because they're mandated to or because they realize the uh, liability involved if somebody um uh, gets scalded or you know gets a blister or something from water that was too hot that being said cody where were we last week in the hotel where that water had to be a hundred and 30 or Holy Toledo. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. We were at a, I won't name names. It was a chain hotel and man alive, you opened up that faucet and look out. So scalding hot. So we should have left him a, a, a cell sheet or something. <laughs> yeah, we should have got him out of the car and left him cell sheets on mixing valves. Yeah, that that's not a good thing, especially, um, you know, in those big chains, if an attorney gets a hold of a soft tissue lawsuit like that, that's going to cost some money. So yeah, that's, that's good news. And that's, probably what I expect. I thought maybe a little bit higher, but if you had the 50 and the 54 and 41, that, that paints a pretty good picture for us. So thanks for that information. Okay, what else do we have here? Yeah, so what I do, I make a habit now when I check into a hotel, I end up staying at a lot of those, um, what do you call them, the chains, like Cody just said, that are along the interstates, because that seems to be where I end up when I get out of the airplane and have to stay somewhere for the night is, uh, you know, right on an interstate somewhere. And when I drive up to these, you'll see all these PVC pipes coming out of the side of it somewhere, which indicates to me that they've got, what's that picture on the left, 10 or 11 tankless water heaters. And look at the spaghetti mess of venting and intake air going out the side of, uh, or out the building somewhere or so. But that seems to be pretty common that they just start battering together these tankless water heaters, you know, the space, um, the ability to modulate them on as the load changes in the building, these things will just step fire in. So, you know, if you look at it that way, it, it's really a good application to get just the amount of water that you need at any given point in time. <clears throat> you would also have some um, some redundancy there. You know, if one or two of those went down, you could probably still function that building. But um, uh, if a tank type of water heater goes out, then you're pretty much out of hot water in the building. So, um, and then uh, that picture on the right is actually at the pepper mill out in, um, out in Reno. That's the tanks that were being used to store the water from that big uh, uh, plate heat exchanger that I showed you a couple of slides earlier. So thousands of gallons of water being stored in that, in that picture. And that sometimes depend on your application. That's the kind of, um, system that you'd want to have where you've got a big 
storage amount, a big battery or flywheel, if you will, of hot water. So if everybody comes in like a ski lodge where everybody's going to come in from skiing, they're going to be cold probably and they want to take a shower. So you might have every shower in that building running at one point in time. So you either have to generate that water instantly, like that battery of tankless water heaters I just showed you, or have enough of water stored that you can... Uh, that you can cover that load and then you have through the night to recover those tanks and uh, start over again the next morning or the next day. So one way or another, you got to meet the load, whether you do it quickly or whether you just, um, like I say, have a big thermal flywheel that you've cranked up. So one thing that you're going to find, regardless what type of uh, device that you use to heat your domestic hot water, is that the minerals in the water can cause a lot of problems. I took this picture years ago at a at a trade show somewhere. I think it was a Bradford White rep had a booth next to me or something. He had this, I think that was a piece of four inch copper with a two inch branch coming off it that they cut out of a building somewhere up in uh, up in Minnesota. And um, you can see number one, a lot of scale buildup that's gonna reduce the flow of that. But that same scale is in whatever that water came from, whether it's a tank type of water heater or tankless, whatever it might be. So. Um, I found this interesting study that um, Purdue did. Purdue does a lot of studies on water quality and water things, and I found this, and I'm sorry that's so small in there, but basically, if I can read the title there, lowering water heater temperature will significantly reduce the rate of lime and scale formation in a water heater tank. And of course, the opposite is true. And so as we take a tank from uh, 120 to 140, 160, plan on a lot more minerals coming out of there and a lot more maintenance. You're going to have to go to that tank and make sure that you um, flush it out. If it's a tankless type of water heater or flat plate type of heat exchanger, you're going to have to occasionally go back there and um, run a descaling, you know, like a, a mild acid or something through there to make sure that you're, uh, you're keeping your efficiencies where they need to be or you're not turning your pipes into a, I guess, a boat anchor, I like to call that, because it was certainly a heavy piece of uh, copper with all those minerals in it so uh, yeah read that study if you get a chance it's on their website if you go there and uh, their engineering uh, uh, school up at Purdue has a lot of good information on that and I think I got a similar picture that uh, I think thanks Ray Parent um, sent me this picture I think this was what did you, Cody you know a little bit about this was this a tankless out of a tankless boiler or a coil or something this picture uh, you know I'm not 100% sure on that one yeah, anyways, it's certainly reduced the size of that uh, opening sure. that pipe, but also wherever that water came from, you can count on those same mineral uh, scaling buildup uh, going on back there. So there's a couple different ways that we can deal with scaling minerals in water. On the right there, we show kind of how a, a water softener works, which is basically an ion exchange. We exchange the hardness ion for the sodium ion, whoops, sorry, uh, in the salt in the brine tank, and then we end up with water that has most of the scaling minerals, all the scaling minerals, the calcium, magnesium, the typical, again, you can't see those little bubbles. Some of the ions in those bubbles have a positive charge. Some of them have a negative charge uh, by running it through a water softener and doing an exchange on the ions. We can pull out the scaling minerals. We still have some sodium in there, but we've pulled out the minerals that are causing what you see in the picture. That being said, not everybody likes a water softener. They don't like the feel of the water. It does use salt. Um, it's not great for the environment, putting all that salt down the drain. In some areas, I think they've even been banned because they use a lot of water to backwash too. So there are other technologies out there. Some of you have maybe seen these uh, magnets that you can strap on the outside of your pipe. Uh, I don't know about that. I've tried them a couple of times. Some people swear by them and others swear at them. So. Another one is that TAC, Watts I know promotes this. It's basically, um, it doesn't remove the, the minerals from the water. It just keeps them locked um, in suspension or locked up or what's another word for that? Just keeps them so they don't settle out and scale on your, um, on your pipes and your heat exchange surface and stuff like that. So those are a couple different options. There's one more option that, um, that we'll show you. I think I've got on the next slide. Check again, I got about seven minutes. Oh, so there's a deliming kit. I'll show you this first. Uh, this is the one I've got here in my shop. It's basically it comes. It's got a little pump in it. It's got a couple hoses. Uh, it's got a little. I think it comes with a pint of a maybe a citrus, some type of acid that's in there. Dump the acid in the bucket. Plug in the pump. It's a little submersible pump, and it just pumps through your uh, your tankless boil or coil, or whatever. I actually use it on mixing valves. Hook it up to both sides of a mixing valve and just let that acid 
uh, circulate through a mixing valve to get the scale and the minerals out of it. So again, if you're in a hard water condition and you're running elevated temperatures, you might be doing this a couple times a year to make sure that you're keeping those um, uh, those heat exchangers or those pipes, as you saw in the previous drawings, um, from getting plugged up with all that scale. Okay, vinegar works, CLR works, there's other chemicals you can use. You don't have to buy that specific acid. If it runs out, you can put other things in. So yeah, we were over in Italy here again a couple months ago, and that's uh, Eric Ani's arms in the picture there. And this is a product that we developed, and it's a phosphate doser. And you can see it on the bottom of those, uh, the one's a tankless boiler, one's a combi boiler, I think. And so basically what it does, it just injects a little bit of phosphate into the water as it goes into the, into the heater, in the tankless heater, whatever it might be. And so what the phosphate does, it will lock up those minerals similar to that TAC uh, technology. It doesn't take them out, it doesn't remove them, it doesn't backwash them down the drain it just keeps them in suspension so that they don't settle out on the coils inside that boiler um, it's a clever little thing you can uh, you can see the little beads that go in there when it gets depleted you just add some more um, uh, the phosphate beads or resins I guess they call them in there so we're trying to see if this might be a product that we can bring into the US market <clears throat> probably have to upsize it a little bit they tend to have smaller piping and uh, lower domestic hot water um, needs maybe over there so we want to see and i think after we got back uh, eric had a picture of that tattooed on his other arm where he's got the wrench on one of them <laughs> up there. um so he's yeah. pretty committed at that point <laughs> uh, no he was of all the things that we looked at he as you can see he was pretty enamored by this because he knows the problem certainly up in minnesota there's some of the hardest water in the country up there and certainly you um you know you want to deal with those minerals the best you can so yeah, we'll look at, and some of the manufacturers I, th I think are already offering a product similar to this. It might be a cartridge or something that you just take the whole cartridge out. But as with everything that Cleffy makes, we kind of engineered some unique features in the way that this puts the, the amount into the water. Some people just use an orifice and it always takes a certain amount, but we've got a little bit more engineering in ours that it um, doesn't go through the phosphate um, needlessly or too quickly. All right. Okay, I got a few more minutes. Yeah, so what do you think of that? You think uh, we're up in the night with that? Or do you think that would be useful? <clears throat> I think we've got about three years on it now over in Europe that we've had that in the market. So we do have a little input and some intel as far as um, uh, how they work and how well they perform. Know too that some of the jurisdictions out there, uh, water uh, departments are actually adding uh, polyphosphates to their water. Any place that there's lead piping, like Flint, Michigan, for example, they'll actually use phosphates injected into the water. Uh, Denver started doing this, I think, a year or two ago because of lead piping around Denver, and that's supposed to, you know, protect that lead from leaching in the water. So, heck yes, oh, I like that. Well, <laughs> that's that. good to know. Yeah. All right, what else do I have here? All right, so one last thing. So this is a question that of the 35 questions I looked at, the pre-submitted ones came up a lot. Okay, so is it worth spending money on a heat pump type of water heater or more expensive tankless or combi boiler? You know, there's a couple things that you have to look at. You know, what's it cost to operate it? And this Copail Wells website, I will say, has an excellent uh, fuel cost calculator in that it has a lot of things, even corn. I don't know how many people are burning corn out there, but be that as it may. What I like about this, obviously, you can change the cost of the fuel. Uh, you can see there on natural gas, it has it in two different um uh, measurements because if you look at your bill some bills read in therms our bills here happen to read in the uh, in the cubic volume instead of the cubic foot instead of a therm but also you can change the efficiency so if you go over there on the far right uh, column if you have a heat pump water heater and you know the efficiency of that you can put that number in so you can really get a pretty accurate comparison on the type of fuel so that's part of the decision you know if you're somewhere where you're paying you know, four cents a kilowatt hour for off-peak electric, like in Quebec or hydro places. Certainly electricity could be a player there. If you're paying 28 cents a kilowatt hour, like somebody I talked to yesterday, maybe electric resistance isn't in your future and you want to look at one of the other sources. So that would be the first thing to look at is how much it's going to be uh, costing. What I will... Um, say is there's places that they do hybrid systems where if the electric you can buy it at a certain time of day at a really low cost like in quebec for example uh they can use a resistant heat when it makes sense to and then go over to an oil fired or a gas fired uh, device when the um 
when the electric rates go up in the peak time of day or something like that. So um, you can look at that. So that would be one part of it. And then, you know, um, oh, I think I talk about it on the next slide here. <clears throat> These are the other things that come into the uh, the equation when you're trying to either, you know, for your own house, is it? Is it for a customer? Is it for a commercial application? Is it a rental property? And every one of those customers or uses would probably have different um, priorities. You know, rental property, in my experience, they want what's the least expensive thing you can get in there and get hot water. You know, the tenant's paying the cost to operate it. We just want to, you know, replace it with the least amount of expenditure. So they might have a different criteria than you would have where you you know you're more concerned about you know how long it's going to last or what it costs to run it um while you do have it and certainly a commercial customer probably says i just need a lot of hot water you know my bottom line is i can't run out so whatever you give me make sure it's going to cover my load going back to the calculator make sure you get that right and, you know brand recognition to some extent you know it's uh, some people just know certain brands or their family or their parents have had an A.O. Smith water heater. So by God, they're sticking with A.O. Smith. So, and then of course, uh, what's available in your market, like Cody said, finding any water heater in some areas right now is, uh, is a challenge. So I think the brand recognition would go out the window if you can only find one water heater in your city right now. Okay. I think I'm getting to the end here. I could time this out pretty good. Yeah, so just to wrap the whole thing up, you know, determine your load, select your fuel source based on the little chart that I just showed you, uh, where you're going to put this device. If it has to go in a small space, obviously a heat pump water heater might not be the best thing. If you want to go with electric tank, this water heater, make sure you got enough power in your electric panel to cover that. Uh, combustion air requirements, if it's just a regular tank type of atmospheric burner, uh, all things you know, that come into the decision on what type of a uh, heater. Uh, certainly codes, make sure that you uh, have the codes in mind when you put in a water heater for all those uh, safety and for legal requirements. And of course, um, installation to make sure that you maintain the warranty on the product. You know, it has to be put in with a thermal expansion tank, for example, so you don't blow it up on high pressure, things like that. So, um, I will get to every question that was submitted if I didn't answer it throughout this presentation. In fact, I wrote a couple of them down. I think I covered them. Um, I think Bob from out at Sun Earth asked me a, a water meter to, that we could use for um, the flow testing, like I talked about at the top end. Yeah, I just went online. I found a dozen companies that have water meters from $39 up to $800. So uh, some of those meet a standard. You know, AWWA actually does have a, a water meter standard, how accurate it has to be, you know, a wobble plate or a single or dual jet type of water meter. But yeah, you can find those if you want to start measuring your customer's um, water consumption. Um, I think that was the last slide, Max. We have a couple housekeeping at the end. Are any questions, Cody? That have you been monitoring anything that jumped out yeah. at you? Is a good question. No, I, I've been monitoring all of them and trying to get to most of them and everything. You know, I, I think you hit the nail on the head with a lot of this stuff. I mean, it's just just a lot of things to consider. You know, and and uh, we did have a couple of things that I wanted to talk about real quick. Uh, the first one was there was a good question from a gentleman that was asking about the water demand calculator. Do you know of any jurisdictions that have actually adopted that? I mean, I, I, I know it's it's fairly new, so I, I don't yeah, know how well it's going over yet. Yeah, so I think, um, what is the international or UPC? One of the codes is going to have it in their next one. But that being said, the individual jurisdictions can choose whether they um, adopt it or not. So yeah. let's say a 2022 code book comes out. It doesn't mean that everybody, they might still be using the 2018 or whatever another year would be. But my understanding is it's going to be in the uh, UPC. Uh, if it isn't in already, it's going to be in the next version. And then again, it'll be up to the individual jurisdictions to decide if they want to um, uh, to adopt that version of the code that would have it in there. I think it's been out long enough now that they've got a, enough good feedback and input. You can see they're on version 2.0, so they've done some uh, uh, tweaking and adjusting to that, and they feel that they've got a pretty good, um, accurate way of doing it. So I would encourage you to just start using it and look at it, and you'll find. I don't know if you remember when uh, Pete and Gary Klein did that webinar for us here a couple of months ago. You might find an 80% difference in the number that you know the building was built to or used with the hunter curve compared to what so that's going to scare some people and say that's that's a huge number but i'll bet no one engineers there's probably still some 
uh, some fudge or some error in those calculations that they use to come up with that. So, um, yeah, pipe sizing, everything changes when you can change the load of a building by 80%. You might go from a two-inch pipe to a one-inch pipe in that building. So, PRVs. Oh, I think that uh, Pete and Gary said that um, depending on your inspector or your jurisdiction that you can say, hey, I'd like to use this calculation. I know it's not part of our code currently. Will you allow that? And as long as it's stamped by somebody, they may allow that. So even if you'd have to wait a couple more years, you may just check with your inspector if you wanted to use that as the calculation method. I would say the states like we're in that are running out of water would be open to that suggestion and say, yeah, we'd love to see a you know, size down that uh, the amount of water that we have to supply to that building. So, yeah, you don't get what you don't ask for. Just meet with your uh, your inspector and say, listen, this is the number that I come up with, uh, and here's the my uh, reason I came up or how I came up with that number, and uh, see what they say. Well, and Bob, too, I just realized that Gary is actually on with us today. So uh, oh, thanks for joining us, Gary. And he actually yeah. mentioned here, too, that the water demand calculator has been available since the 2018 UPC. And it's actually been adopted, he says, here in Washington, Oregon, North Dakota, and Nevada. And it's also been used in New York, Texas, and California. And it's funny, you know, you mentioned California. You know, you talk about one of the most drought-stricken states, you know, in, in a lot of cases. And, and I, I know we talk to our rep down there frequently, and they're, they're sizing commercial buildings based on Hunter's Curve. And the inspector they're like a dog with a bone they will not let it go it has to be to the hunter's curve which means they're wildly oversizing so much of this stuff and it's it's just crazy um but the other thing i wanted to mention too bob was you know uh you know realistic expectations you know if you've got a customer that has a, a tank style water heater that they installed 10 years ago and they paid for it and they've literally never thought about it since because it just always works things are a little different with a tankless water heater you know they do need maintenance and everything else and it's it's you got to set those expectations for that homeowner that that customer because otherwise they're going to be uh, a little bit disappointed so thank you with a combi boiler i mean a huge fan of them because i've lived with three of them now at my house my shop and my mother-in-law's house i know they work and they do exactly what they say it's just that you're right, it might not be for everybody. If they want to run every fixture in their house at the same time, it's going to take a pretty sizable tank that's water heater. To so either they got to change their um, lifestyle or expectations or, yeah, give them, at the end of the day, you got to give them what they want or they're paying you to do. But, yeah, there is a bit of a learning curve when you when you go to a tankless heater but they, they or a combi, uh, but they certainly do exactly. You know, people say, well, the combis are too complicated. There's so much can go wrong. But if you look under the hood, I mean, it's a it's a diverting valve, it's a heat exchanger, it's a flow switch. It's not like it makes it that much more complicated in there. So uh, when people say that, I say, well, you know, the mod cons are complicated compared to a tank water heater to begin with, but um, the actual domestic hot water portion of that is really just a heat exchanger and a, either a pump or a diverting valve to make it work. So don't be frightened off by, you know, the combi boilers because of the uh, uh, the plate heat exchanger that happens to be in there. Uh, I think we got time for one last question here, Bob, and then we'll cut everybody loose. Uh, there was a couple comments about tankless water heaters and their high pressure drop through through the heat exchangers and the flow rates and everything like that. Um, yeah. You know, one one actually asks, how are people dealing with the high pressure drop through many tankless or you know cascaded type uh, tankless heaters? Well, and that's a good, that's an excellent point, actually. I mean, if you've got somebody that only has, you know, the minimum the code allows, I think it's 20 PSI. If you come to that customer that only, for whatever reason, has 20 PSI coming in their house, yeah, they're probably not going to be a good uh, a good candidate for a, a tankless water heater because of the pressure drop going through it. And, of course, the pressure drop is related to how much you're flowing through that at one time. What I find with, what I found with my own tankless water heater is we do one thing at a time. Either the, the, the wash machine's running or I'm taking a shower or we're doing, a you know, uh, the dishwasher or something like that. We just, I knew and we learned not to try and expect more. I mean, the water still comes out of it. It's just like you say, it doesn't get as warm and the, the pressure drop uh keeps going up as you start flowing more. Now, I think they ported them out a little bit from some of the original ones that you look at them, it looked like an eighth inch copper tube that the old Palomas or something like that wrapped around the thing. I think they're, you know, they've got a little bit better flow rates as they've, uh, you know, engineered them over the years. And uh, I mean, all that information is or should be available from the manufacturer as far as, you know, the pressure drop that, um, that you'll see and also the uh, uh, GPM based on the temperature rise. 
Well, cool. I think that pretty much covers it. And like you said, Bob, too, I mean, if there's any questions that we did not get to, obviously, we'll get back to you in a timely manner. And and yeah, uh, yeah. thanks. Thanks, Bob. That was a great, uh, great overview on, on the different options that we have available to us. So well, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks to my team for helping me through this presentation and all the stuff that's involved and put these together. Uh, other places you can get a hold of us there on the social media slide you see, if you'd like to uh, use one of those platforms. I mean, I'll still answer an email. You can send me a letter in the mail and I'll answer it. So <laughs> call me on the phone, we'd be loved. And everybody at Cleppy is is willing and available to help you with, with any questions. And if I don't know, I'll find out. I, I know a lot of people in the industry, Gary, for example, with the calculator that I can call up and say what's uh, I'd like to get you know get get it from the horse's mouth so to speak talk to somebody that's actually doing it and has experience with these which is why I was happy to put this heat pump water heater in and actually hear and see how it works and feel <laughs> the, all the senses with the heat pump water here you can hear it you can feel it and uh, uh, you can see it takes a lot of space too so thanks everybody again happy holidays Merry Christmas um, we'll see you hopefully at ASHRAE or if not um, on the pages here in February. So, anybody else? Bueller, Bueller. I think no. that's it, Bob. Thanks everybody for your time. Thanks. Bye bye.